called The Second Coming. It was in Bartleby Snopes uh, in September of this year. Jesus Christ did not rise at 7.20 on the evening of May 23, 1928, as the Reverend Herbert Barnes had foretold. The hundred people assembled around Smith's cellar door began to drift away after 30 minutes of inaction. But the preacher continued to exhort the dwindling numbers. Lord, our Savior, we implore thee, come to us poor sinners. Come that we may hear thy words. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. An hour later, only the grand spinsters and Charity Smith were kneeling with him. Pleasing and precocious, Charity had just turned 17. Tonight, in honor of the impending second coming of the Lord, and not coincidentally, to impress prospective bows. who might be in the crowd. She was wearing her new white sundress. Reverend Barnes was in black serge. Long white hair flowed to his shoulders, and a prophet's beard covered the front of his frock coat. He turned to Charity, tiny black eyes glinting under his top hat. You should go in the house now, my child. I will be in momentarily. I must see to the cellar. I fear foul play. Peering into the darkness, Reverend Barnes whispered, Sam, where the hell are you? Back in the corner, among some wooden kegs, the reverend spied the splayed out figure of the unresurrected Christ. The white robe was dirty, his long blonde hair disheveled, and the beard had drifted off his chin. Sam, what in God's name happened? Well, we was down here getting ready, me and Charity, and was looking for some place I could sit and tell the time. And that's when I saw these kegs. I can smell the liquor on you, the reverend said. This resurrection was going to carry us into Lubbock and every town in West Texas. We'll have to go 500 miles before we find someone who hasn't heard of this debacle. He reached down to pull Sam to his feet. Get up, you separate fool. You think we could take a cake with us? It's powerful, good. That did it. The Reverend left Sam where he was sprawled. Christ or a dime a dozen. I'm getting me a new one. Give me that wig and beer. As he was leaving, Charity poked her head into the cellar. What are you doing down there? What happened to that fellow was with you? Pa's upstairs wondering if he's going to get paid. The Reverend took her by the arm and led her toward the barn. Charity, a young woman like you, a small town like this, doesn't make sense. I thought about a new way to bring people to the Lord. And Charity, you're part of that, a big part. From the time she was seven, and learned about a world outside Loveland, Texas. Charity knew her future was anywhere but this flat, brown land interrupted by nothing higher than cotton balls. This preacher might be her ticket. I'd have to talk to my folks. Besides, there's the money you owe, Paul. He tugged on his beard. The way I see it, your father and his illegal liquor caused our Lord and Savior to stay in his tomb tonight. And, that I'll, and now that I'm acquainted with your pa's ways, I might easily have a word with the sheriff. The reverend looked back towards the faded white clapboard house and saw Mrs. Smith peeking out from behind the lace curtains. He steered Charity so the barn was between them in the house, put his arm around her and pulled her toward him. Reverend Barnes, what are you doing? The love of God is flowing through me, sister, and directing me to show you that special love he has for you. He was looking into cornflower blue eyes, set among fair features, and couldn't resist. Thin lips poked out from his snowy beard and moved towards Charity's pink ones. The sweetness he'd hoped to taste was soured by the sharp stab between his legs. He curled up on the ground and closed his eyes. And slowly, painfully, he uncoiled himself and looked up at Charity. Herbert, the way I see it is this. You could have made a small fortune out there tonight. You talk real good, but you're sloppy, she said. So I'm going with you. We'll do the Lord's mission and all that stuff, but I'm calling the shots. He struggled to get his feet under him. A mixture of hope and trepidation trickled through him. Number one, no hick towns. We're going to Austin, where real money is, she said. And you're getting rid of that pathetic costume and hair. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Number two, touch me again, and you better hope the border's an hour away and you've got yourself a fast car. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Three, I'll take the 50 bucks you owe, Paul, plus whatever else you got. I'm running the money. Reluctantly, the Reverend handed her $100, hide in a 20. They arrived in Austin late the next afternoon. Driving down Brazos Street, Charity asked him to stop the car. She hopped out, suitcase in hand, and ran down the street. Sister Charity, stop, stop, where are you going, he called. She turned, lifting her arms heavenward, and crooned, and now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, and the greatest of all of these in charity, is charity, but you can't depend on charity.